Welcome to the Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. Larry is the author of over 40 books, the founder of Dove International, a worldwide family of churches and ministries in six continents, and has over 50 years of leadership experience. He and his guests will share inspirational leadership insights from their journey with God. These insights, gleaned from serving leaders in many nations, will transform your life and leadership. For more information on Larry's books and resources, visit LarryKreider.com. Welcome to the Larry Carter Leadership Podcast. Larry Carter here in the studio with me again today is Peter Bunton. Welcome, Peter. Larry, great to be here. Well, I'm really looking forward to our focus today. And for all those listening throughout the world, I think last we checked, we're now connecting with 172 nations wow. by the grace of God. Yeah. Got about 25 maybe nations to go yet. Uh, and so the leadership truths we talk about apply across the globe, across the world, and any culture, obviously. Today we're going to talk about leadership from the perspective of cell groups, small groups, house churches, and what history teaches us about that coming from your book yeah. that I love. I recommend this book really all over the world, Peter, okay. Cell Groups and House Churches, What History Teaches Us. So we want to dive right in today. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. This all right. And because I've learned so much from you on this, and I've been so blessed, uh, again, with all that I've learned from you. And I want our friends around the world to have the same blessing right now. Okay. So again, okay. you can pick out that book and check the show notes, pick out that book online uh, by checking with the dev store or however you want to do that. So number one, how did, or rather, why did you write this book, Peter? Yeah, well, thank you, Larry. Great to be here. Um, I wrote this book uh about 20 years ago now, right. actually. And it came from the fact that I was reading a lot of books about cell groups right. and cell church, how to do cell church today. And mm -hmm. everyone seemed to say, hey, this was in the Bible. It was New Testament. And then there was virtually no reference to anything in the 2,000 years right, between right. the biblical times, New Testament mm -hmm. times, and mm -hmm. us today. Maybe with the exception of John Wesley. Right. There were quite a few books that would talk about how John Wesley used different yeah. forms of uh, small group. As you know, so, he's one of my heroes. <laughs> yes, I do know that. So we will get to Wesley. Good, I, pro good. I promise you we can mention All Wesley. Right. But I guess I wanted to look at history and think, if this is a God thing, then mm -hmm. surely there were other examples right, that exactly. we could look at and learn exactly. from. So that was my motivation, yeah. really, in beginning this study and this book. Right. And of course, in the Dove Global family, we believe so much in a small group, cell groups, knowing it's a place for discipleship, it's a place where people can grow, people can learn yes. leadership, all that can happen there. Yes. So today we speak of often small groups and cell groups and life groups, whatever. In your investigation of cell groups in church history, what were they called? Well, yeah, very different names. And I looked at a period really from the Reformation onwards for a few hundred years, and the Puritans called them right. conventicles. Uh, wow. Wesley had class meetings. He had bands. Right. Um, some of the pietists in the Lutheran churches called them collegia pietatis. Wow, which I is, can't even say that. It's a Latin word that really means... Holy groups, groups oh, wow. for holiness. Wow. Um, societies was used. So there's a lot of different terminology out there for this yeah, yeah. phenomenon of small group meetings, right, which right. we should kind of go into, yep. I think. So 2,000 years of church history is a lot of time, yes. Peter. <laughs> which periods or movements did you study? Yes, as I said, I really started with the Reformation. I'm not saying there wasn't anything before, but right. I looked at the great reformers. Mm -hmm. And then through the Pietists, the Puritans, mm -hmm. some of the Lutherans, mm -hmm. Wesley, the Methodists, the Moravians, really through to about the year 1800. So okay. it was a kind of a 300-year history, yeah. really, from about 1500 to 1800, largely in Europe, mm -hmm. um, but that was in many ways the center of the theological discussion and True. leadership of, of much of the worldwide church exactly. at that time. Exactly. Well, let's start then with the Reformation. Did the Reformation bring about the use of small groups, cell groups, some groups, or not? Yes, and that's such an interesting question because I could say yes and no. So really? let me let me give you that answer. I would say, for example, Martin Luther, the great reformer in Germany, he developed a theology that made a way for small groups, perhaps without actually implementing them. Really? Because if you think about it, the Reformation was really the priesthood of all believers. Right, exactly. It was a great option. Mm -hmm. 
we are all servants of God. Right. We can all hear from God. We can all study the scriptures for ourselves. And that was very revolutionary in the 16th century in Europe. And a theology like that means that lay people can get together and read God's word and teach each other and confess their thoughts and pray right, for right, each right. other, even administer sacraments. Right. So Luther's theology started to pave a way for small groups. He himself uh, did actually advocate them, but didn't quite implement them. So he um, talked about how we should set up new forms of church meeting mm -hmm. where believers can meet in homes. Mm -hmm. They can even baptize one another. They can hear one another's confession and pray for each other. Yeah. So he wrote that, right. but he didn't actually go on to uh, implement that strategy. Well, let's talk about that. Because again, you mentioned he advocated for the development of, of these small groups, cell groups, whatever you, we want to call them. And then my next question was, did he actually implement them, his proposal? You say he really didn't explain that. Yes. Well, it, when he was translating the liturgy into German okay. um, in about 1526 is when he published what's called the German Mass, he wrote in the preface, let's start these groups. This is okay. the kind of thing they could do. But then he also wrote at the end, but we Germans, and I'm quoting, we're a wild, rude, tempestuous people <laughs> with whom one must not likely make experiment in anything new. Wow, well, I have a German background, so I appreciate that, Peter. <laughs> so Luther said, yes, let's do this. And at the end, he almost stopped himself saying, but we're a pretty wild people. I'm not sure this <laughs> would work out too well right now. That's so funny. So some people have been critical of him for not... Okay. Okay. actually mm -hmm. implementing what he was suggesting. Mm -hmm. But also, I feel like we need to be a little bit kind to him because don't forget, he was translating the scriptures right. into German for the first time. He was at times holed up in a castle. He was kind of on the run for his life. Right. The Catholic authorities were trying right. to get him and <laughs> wanted to execute him. So he had a lot going on. And in those 20 years, he was developing a whole kind of new theology. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get round actually to start these small groups in his churches. But I feel like I want to give him some real okay. grace in okay. that, given everything else that was going right. on. So Luther did not get around to starting small groups, small groups. I get that. Yeah. Were there any reformers during that time or later who actually did? Yes. Actually, uh, Zwingli in Switzerland yeah. in 1520 mm -hmm. in Zurich, he mm -hmm. started small groups. He wanted people to come together to share and uh, apply the teaching from sermons and so on. So for a number of years, he began to do that. But in 1525, the city authorities tried to put a stop on that whole thing. Mm. There are some people who actually said, no, we still need to meet. And then they baptized or rebaptized each other. Right. And that was some of the beginnings of the whole Anabaptist uh, movement. Right. Right. Or there was Martin Busser in Strasbourg. Right. Right. And he, in the 1540s, started what he called true Christian communities. And these were small group meetings in homes. He felt this was a return to the early church. He even said, I don't think there's any way we can keep the Ten Commandments unless we meet together and keep each other accountable wow. in groups such as this. Wow. So there were reformers who went beyond Luther and actually started some of these groups, yeah. but many of them eventually found yeah. opposition or even persecution and the city authorities yeah. trying to ban them. It happened in Strasbourg yeah, as yeah. well. Well, I appreciate you doing this, sharing this so much because, of course, our heart has been small groups, you know, yes. small groups. You know, what, it was probably 45, 47 years ago, had a revelation of the underground church, which, go yeah. back to the Bible, small groups, small groups. Yeah. And, a lot, and so a lot of people say, well, it's in the Bible, we see that, but it really hasn't happened much until recently, and that just is not true. Correct. It's, God keeps returning us to that. I mean, I, I wrote a book, House to House, way back in the day, about 25, 30 years ago. It had to do with all this, you know, how to experience healthy small groups and house searches. And again, that's available on the show notes if, if you're interested. Let's take the next step. Who were some of the other groups to begin using small groups? Sure. I, mean, I mentioned the early reformers, but the Puritans in okay. England started such groups. They called them conventicles, and they were about purifying church life. And so they would meet together for prayer, 
singing, conferring, uh, even when some of the Puritans came over from England right. to, at that time, the colonies, New England, uh, Cotton Mather was a leader there. And he began a whole network of conventicles. He had 12 mm. people in each group. Uh, one of the Puritan leaders said, I, I quote him here, uh, that he saw more success in discipling those who came to the conventicles than from all my public preaching to them. Isn't that amazing? That was Richard Baxter. So yeah. he was like, this is transforming people's lives. Wow. Uh, people like the pietists in the Lutheran churches and in the Reformed churches throughout Europe uh, were starting groups like this. Uh, a famous man was Spener. Mm -hmm. uh, he led the way. Right. Then Anglican societies in England from about 1670, they started what they called societies for the purpose of personal holiness but the anglican societies quickly developed into kind of social outreach they began like movements to transform society on ethical issues so there was this kind of outworking from those and then perhaps people have heard of the moravians right coming right. out of what is sure. you know germany today mm -hmm. And they had uh, small groups. They called some of them bands, which is just a small group of people coming together to share, to confess their sins for one another, um, and saw a great you know, transformation of people because of that. In fact, um, coming to John Wesley in 1738, he went to Herrenhut in Germany to visit the Moravians, and he wrote <laughs> about, he found about 90 of these small groups meeting two to three times a week, Wesley wrote. Um, so uh, Wesley kind of also picked up some of his ideas from what he saw That's from so the Moravians. That's so interesting to me because, you know, of course, I'm a great fan of John Wesley. I've you know read his books and autobiography and on and on, learned so much from him. And yes. he'd always talk about having bands and having societies, having classes. I thought he came up with that, Peter, mm. but he learned that from somebody else. Yes. And it wasn't just the Moravians. He learned uh, from some of the Anglican yeah. societies and different people. So yes, he uh, he took things. He was influenced by other people. And we all are. Really. We are. We, we sure all are. learn from <laughs> other people. There's nothing new under the sun, yeah. you know, really. And perhaps that's why looking at history can help yeah, us because we course. can learn. Yeah. Let's talk about John Wesley. Yeah. You know, what about the Methodists? I'm assuming they formed these small groups, as you mentioned. Tell us yes. more. Sure. Well, Wesley became this master at networking and managing yeah. this movement. Right. And there were really five kinds of groups. There were societies, okay. and they really became congregations, in effect. But he had the class meetings. Okay. And these were groups of 12 people. Uh, there could be men and women, different ages. They cut it off at 12? Yes. Okay. Yes, very roughly. 12 okay. people uh, was, was the guide there. And... Uh, they could have non-believers coming to those meetings, people of different backgrounds. And so this became like a cell group or a sure. small group today where yeah. people would share, they'd discuss teaching and preaching. So that was the class meeting. But the, he then established bands, and these were the same gender, same marital status, similar age. And this is where people really got real in saying, this is where I've messed up this week. This is where I've sinned. This is where I've fallen. And Wesley had certain questions for the group right. to ask one another. And these another. were smaller groups, Peter? Yes, often just two, three, four people. So um, Yes, yeah, same gender. So it was really this personal holiness. Where are we struggling? And again, Wesley wrote, um, I have found by experience mm. that one of these people has learned more from one hour's close discourse than 10 years public preaching. Wow. So Wesley was sold on the idea of these bands for producing holiness. But also he developed something called select societies. And this was really a kind of a leadership training yes, forum. Right, He'd right. bring the class leaders together. He was a genius. He, really he was, was very, very sharp <laughs> with these things. And 
they would discuss together leadership issues, how we lead these classes, how we lead these groups. So the Select Societies was like a leadership training venue. Mm -hmm. And he, he also established penitent bands. These were for the people uh, who were really um, making a mess of things and needed special help. Really? He called it people who have made a shipwreck of their faith. Wow. And really, if you look at the list of reasons why people would go into these penitent bands. It was for drunkenness. It was for wife beating. It was for mm. stealing. So in a sense, they became a bit like our, you know, 12-step recovery right. groups Right, crisis groups today. or whatever, yeah. Yes, more kind of counseling intervention groups. So he had different groups. So the class meeting of 12, the bands, but leadership groups. And also he realized he needed to establish something different for those who had specific mm -hmm. life besetting mm -hmm. problems and issues. Peter, you're helping me so much because, you know, as we've taught on small groups and and people growing in Christ and discipleship all over the world, uh, when I'm with a larger congregation, I'll tell the leaders, really consider finding a way to have small groups, having small groups, even yes. if it's 12 or 20 or whatever, yeah. start there. But then I tell the small group leaders or even house church leaders, if you have 10 people or 12 people or 15 people in a house church or in a small group, have smaller groups. Yes. Somewhere yeah. where there's two or three Absolutely. in my name, in Jesus as I'm yes. in the midst of them, and mm -hmm. where you can really get real and really pray for each other. And, and then, of course, what about people going through severe crisis? They need their own groups. Yes. And how do you train leaders? Yes. You, you, there needs to be a separate group for that. So, I, of course, as you know, I love John Wesley and all he's done, but this even makes me love what he's done even more as I hear yes. you talk about this. It, he was a great example, really, yeah. for many of these amazing, things. Amazing, amazing. Yes. Did the small groups um, that we have encountered in these different historical movements only do well with certain types of people? Now, I would say... Small groups could be used universally because we saw uh, small groups in all kinds of different denominations, Lutherans, Anglicans, Methodists, mm -hmm. different kinds of cultures you know, in Sweden, in Germany, right. in uh, North America, uh, different denominations, different historical mm -hmm. eras, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, different social groups. Some right. were workers. Um, Zinzendorf of the Moravians even had small groups meeting among the, mo the nobility in palaces and castles. So wow. every kind of social economic group, um, they seem to work. They seem right. to work universally. Right. I just want to say to all those listening from around the world, you know, if you want to know more of Peter's book, Cell Groups and House Churches, What History Teaches Us, That's a great book. And uh, what we can learn today from the use of small groups in the centuries since the Reformation. And thank you for writing this. It's helped so many people already. It's going to help so many more. And also more of a, a modern day book on how to, how to see how these small groups, house to house, written by yours truly back about 25 or 30 years ago, updated, of course, so it works today also. A couple more questions for you, Peter. What would you say is a theology that best supports the use of such groups for discipleship and outreach? Yeah, that's a good question because we're not talking about just implementing a structure. There has to be a right. belief system Correct. that allows for that structure Correct. and allows Correct. it to flourish. So I think things like our faith, our Christian faith, it's a corporate faith. It's not just right. an individual faith. Right, right, we need right. each other mm -hmm. to go on with God and to learn uh, that also following God is often a process. That's we right. are saved through Jesus, but there are often things to work out. The belief in the priesthood of all believers, exactly. we can all minister to mm -hmm. one another. We can all be involved with evangelizing and teaching and praying mm -hmm. for one another. Those things are important. Um, also, you know, confession to one another. And even the fact that there at times needs to be some structure and discipline, that we have to have some kind right. of rules and help people understand that that can help contain the work that God is doing. So there is a theology that right. supports right. cell groups and small groups. Right. So what are some of the lessons from your study of history which apply to us today? Well, first of all, I would say something that I just mentioned, that cell groups are an issue of the heart values, not structure. I think that good. became um, true in many of these movements. Uh, we need 
to know what their core values are. That's important. Um, I think we can see how they're useful for personal growth and holiness, but really how they can work in all kinds of churches and situations. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that most of these groups in history saw what they were doing as a return to the early church. Mm -hmm. So that seems to have been a profound kind of motivation that helps people move forward on this journey of having uh, small groups. Mm -hmm. You know, Peter, uh, I find that often parachurch ministries do a great job with small groups. Yes. You were involved years ago in YWAM. Yes. did a great job with small groups. Yes. Crew does a great yes. job. I mean, I can list ministry after ministry, college ministry. Yes, navigators. Navigators, fantastic. Yeah, yes. I learned a lot from Dawson Trotman, the founder yes. of the Navigators, and yes. you know things that I've read that he has taught. Uh, and I, I think often, it's, then we get to the church, it's, it's harder because we're just, many pastors are focusing on having a good meeting, and you know, we need good meetings. I'm not saying we don't, but if we can somehow bring in the reality and the truth from church history and the Bible, yeah. that small groups are so important for people yes. to be discipled. You know, I mean, as yeah. you know, with us in Dublin International, we pastored for years and everyone was in a small group, and, and we called them cell groups for years. Learned that from Dr. Young Cho, you know, from Korea. Uh, and and then we could become a movement because we trained so many leaders, but those leaders were trained, first of all, in small groups. Yes. And you mentioned something so important, and that was we don't focus on the structure. We focus on the life. We focus on people. We yep. focus on what God's doing in people's lives. That's I've it. often said, my body has a structure, and we need a need structure. Without that, I'd be about a foot <laughs> tall on the floor, yeah. but no one ever says to me, "I love your structure." I love you, you know. I love your bone structure. Whether it be crazy, but we need the structure. But we need to make sure we're focusing on the life and focusing yes. on making disciples. Tell us more, Peter. Yes, sure. Well, I think some of the lessons are also that the ones that seem to succeed in history and mm -hmm. last a long while, they're part of a bigger movement. Oh, that's good. It's not just an isolated group on their own, mm. but they're part of something bigger. And that's why the Moravians did well. That's, that's right. why the Methodists that's did right. well, because they were part of this growing movement where they were reaching out beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Moravians traveled out to many nations and established right. small groups. Um, and Wesley the same. So the sense of outreach, part of a bigger movement. But then there was leadership who were providing the training and the structures as well. And so those are the ones that did the best, that lasted a long while and were more transformative of people's lives and the nations. So that's important. And then leadership of the groups themselves. Right. Everything requires some kind of facilitation and mm -hmm. leadership. So that became an important issue. And a number of these stressed it's the actual example of the leader that matters. So with the Methodist, it was usually the leader who went first okay. in sharing about their life or saying, this is how I sinned this week yeah. or this is how I messed up. So leadership by example uh, became a very important issue, I think, um, in the success of some of these small groups. And so the way the meeting is structured can be helpful. It should have an outward focus. Uh, a number of them were open to non-believers as mm -hmm, well. So mm -hmm. there was an evangelistic opportunity within that. And even practical things like don't let the group become too big. Mm -hmm. Spina in Germany in the 1700s, he had groups of like 50 people and it just became unworkable. Right. So even practical sure. things about how we structure a meeting, the size of the group, yeah. emphasize multiplication, um, these things became important uh, as well. A practical thing that we've often encouraged people to consider is if they have a small group of 20, 30, 40, 50 people. I mean, I've known of some small groups, quote unquote, as large as... 70 or 80 people always sounds yeah. crazy. Average church in America, I think, is about 75. We encourage them, have groups within the group. Have prayer groups within the group. Yeah. Have people at some time during the meeting go to different rooms or different parts of the room, get three people, four people, five people, have a small group yes. within the group. Uh, and we find often then people get a sense of, uh, of grace from God that, yes, I can do this. I can lead a little prayer meeting, or I can do this. Right. And then they can lead in other ways in the future. Anything else yes. you want to share with us today? No, I think we, we've we hit a number of good points there. I think looking at the scripture, but looking at church history is yeah. important. So good. And um, we can learn from so much. I think groups are important. 
They need to be led well. They need to be led by example. There needs to be leadership training mm -hmm. and a sense of multiplication. Yeah. But they are the thing that God seems to use mm -hmm. when there is renewal, revival in right. the church, wherever yeah. it is, whatever denomination, right. uh, these small groups pop up again. Yeah. So I think we should take note of that. Exactly. The longest uh, revival in the world that I'm aware of, or awakening, was the East African revival, as far as I understand. And, you know, that was simply people meeting from house to house. Yes. And as God moved throughout all of East Africa, and you would know, you know, a lot about that. And so I have many people in different denominations. And, hey, you know, our, the movement we're part of now is, you know, 44 years old. And it's easy. I mean, it's really easy to forget some of those initial things that God showed us and taught us and use, you know, based on the Bible, church history, like cell groups, small groups. And it becomes secondary. Well, it's not that important. When really, it's extremely important if we want to continue to, to, to see God move in our lives in a powerful way. Peter, this has been so refreshing. Any last minute thoughts? No, thank you for inviting me today. And we're praying that um, God would use groups like this to help yes. us all wherever we are. Yeah, I mean, otherwise we'll look back and say, remember back 40, 50, 60 years ago when God was moving powerfully? The believers were the ministers, but there was a structure that helped that happen. And there was small groups and societies and call them whatever you want, obviously. Yes. Cell groups and house churches, the book. What history teaches us? Pick that up. You get that on Amazon. Get that at the Devon International Bookstore. Uh, and the book, if that's by Peter Bunton, my friend, and uh, then the book House to House, uh, Learning How to Experience Healthy Small Groups and House Churches, uh, written by Larry Kreider. Peter, thank you for being on the podcast again today. Every time that I interview you, you know, on different subjects, I'm always so inspired and I always learn. So thank well, you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, everybody, thank you. You're making this all possible around the world as you're listening to Larry Kreider Leadership Podcast, our heart cry is to uh, talk to leaders from different walks of life, different nationalities, different cultures, and pick the brain, of, as we call it, to see what they've learned about leadership. And then how can we apply that to our lives? Because all it takes is one small area of shift and change. It can revolutionize your life. So we're so glad you've joined us today for the Larry Carter Leadership Podcast. And looking forward to seeing you many, many more times in the future. And we'll be back next week. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. If you want more information about any of Larry's books, daily devotionals, small group resources, or any other teachings, go to LarryKreider.com.